Uh, good morning in Europe and good afternoon in Japan. Uh, welcome all of you to our online debate about the security environment in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, this seminar is organized by Polish Institute of International Affairs, but with close cooperation with Embassy of Japan to Poland and Japan Institute of International Affairs. And it is my great, great pleasure to have with us our guest from Japan, our honorable guest, uh, Ms. Uh, Tomiko Ichikawa, Director General of the Japan Institute of International Affairs. And uh, Director General uh, Tomiko Ichikawa has a very broad uh, curriculum vita. Let me say a few words about our guest. Uh, Ms. Ichikawa uh, assumed the current position in, 20, uh, in July 2020. Uh, she joined the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs in, in, in 1985. And her assignments in, in Japan include directorship at West Europe Division, Economic Integration Division, Non-Proliferation Science and Nuclear Energy Division, as well as Economic Policy Division. Um, uh, Ms. Ichikawa also um, uh, uh, worked abroad uh, uh, in, in Embassy of Japan in UK and Permanent Mission of Japan to the international organizations in Vienna, uh, she also has some position in international organization as political affairs officer in United Nations peacekeeping operation in the former Yugoslavia and spe special assistant to the director general of the International Atomic Energy um, Agency. And also our, uh, our honorable guest participated in the six party talks in 2006-2008 uh, and continued to follow the DPRK nuclear issue at permanent mission in Vienna and um, uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency. Welcome you very, very warmly. Uh, it is also our great pleasure to have with us Ambassador, to, uh, Jap Ambassador of Japan to Poland, uh, His Excellency uh, Akio Miyajima, and our senior um, analyst at PISM, Dr. Oskar Pietrewicz, who deals with uh, Japan and uh, Korean Peninsula. Uh, my name is Ustena Stulik, I'm Deputy Head of Research, and it is my great, great pleasure to chair today's meeting. Before we start our discussion, let me say a few words about uh, where we are right now, because I think it's a very good moment to talk about security in the Indo-Pacific region. And it is very important for us Europeans uh, living in Europe and us as Poles, um, despite the fact that currently we are focusing mostly on what is going on uh, in Russia and we are very afraid of potential Russian aggression against Ukraine. So why it is important for us to know what is going on in Asia and in the Pacific? Uh, because I think there are several links and overlaps uh, between Asia and Europe when it comes to security issues. And uh, what I mean, um, both Europe and Asia are facing security threats coming from big authoritarian neighbors that would like to project its power, that have territorial claims, that would like to change the status quo, change the security architecture, and as a result, it destabilize the region and the neighborhood. And of course, I'm talking about Russia in Europe and China in Asia, and not only Asia. And even more important both for Europe in, in, in Asia is the fact that we are, that the United States, uh, both for Europe and Asia, is a crucial security guarantor. And also the latest Russia's, but also China's threats, I'm talking about respectively against, or, against Ukraine and Taiwan, might be perceived as a test for the US security commitments for allies in Europe and, and Asia. And um, in that sense, both security situations are overlapping and may not be bifurcated one from another. So um, in that sense, both Asia and, and uh, Asian and European countries should share their experience dealing with, uh, with Russia and China. And what is, I think, a new kind of process is strengthening cooperation or ties between China and Russia. And that this fact creates a new situation, I think. Let me very briefly share my personal experience. When I was in Japan uh, in the beginning of 2017, as a part of PISM delegation, we had a meeting with um, and a seminar with GIA, and we discussed China and Russia. Ch China it, as a threat for Japan and Russia as a threat for, for us. And we were told by a Japanese experts that our perspective is different. 
because we as Europeans, what we are looking at is a face of the bear, which means Russia. In that sense, Japan do not look at bear face, but let's say the end of the body of the bear. At the same time, what Japan is looking at is the face of the dragon. And we as, as Europeans, we do not see the face of the dragon, but the tail of the dragon, let's say. But I think that nowadays, when you look what is going on uh, in Russia and China and looking at the strengthening relations, I think that we are both facing faces of the dragon and the bear, both in Japan and, and, and in Poland, for example, in Europe. So I think that in that sense, we also should, should look what is going on in Asia and to try to some, learn some lessons how Asian countries, how Japan is, is uh, dealing with the uh, uh, threats coming from, from China. So I'll stop here. Uh, just one or two sentences about the structure of the meeting. Um, now I would like to pass the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Miyajima. Then it will be the clue of our meeting, uh, the keynote speech by our uh, honorable guest, um, uh, Director uh, General um, Tomiko Ichikawa. Then ask Oscar will provide us with some comments and observations after uh, this keynote speech. Then I will also use my my role as a as a chairwoman to ask several questions to uh, um, to uh, both speakers. And then I would like to open the Q and A session to all the part virtual participants because our our meeting is live streamed on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. So I would like to encourage all of our virtual participants to pose the questions through the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube uh, chat function. I do hope I, that, that I will receive it on my, on my screen, the, the questions, and then they could, they could address them to our speakers. So without any further ado, I would like to pass the floor to um, His Excellency, Ambassador Akio Miyajima. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Ambassador, you are muted. Uh, sorry, yeah. Good morning, everybody. That, well, thank you very much for the kind introduction that uh, Ms. Studelik. And, and also, that, uh, well, nice to see you again, that, uh, Ms. Ichikawa. Um, I'm, I came here to Poland at, uh, uh, almost one year ago, and I have been observing things happening. Uh, but one year ago, that I never expected such a kind of the really serious growing tensions in the other border in, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine. And also that well that actually that the last autumn that we have seen that the, the situation in the border with the Belarus, and then so that the security situation uh, seen from Poland has changed drastically, and then uh, but I think that today's topic uh, that the, the security situation in the Pacific is very timely and very very relevant. Uh, as you know, that this coming Friday, uh, uh, Beijing Olympic is going to be opened, and then uh, Mr. Putin, President Putin, is going to the, the be, have the meeting with Mr. Xi Jinping, and also the your President Duda is going to attend the opening ceremony, and then so oh, 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 as the, the, the uh, Ms. Uh, Studelik said that well, things happening in Europe and Asia is not separate. It is really interconnected, and then maybe that they're reinforcing each other for creating something bad, also something good. So we have to watch globally and then think globally. Uh, yesterday, uh, our foreign minister Hayashi had a phone the conversation with Mr. Blinken, and then that the they uh, confirmed that the strong support for Ukraine and also integral, integral or that the uh, uh, sorry, the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And then, of course, Mr. Rao, the foreign minister of Poland, also had a phone call with Mr. Brinken. And then we believe that as a good ally of the United States, uh, that the both of us, uh, that in Asia and Europe, uh, had many, many things to, uh, to, to share uh, in the common interest. And then today, uh, sorry, that well, maybe before that, I just want to mention that the uh, uh, former foreign minister, Motegi, visited here also at the last year at the May, beginning of the May, and then had a very good bilateral meeting with the president and the foreign minister Rao, and also had a, a, the, the foreign minister's meeting with the other G4 counterparts, I don't know, but G4 counterparts. And then the, there that the they confirmed the importance of uh, uh, rule-based international uh, order. And now what we are seeing 
near the, the Poland, there is the, the huge challenge. And then so how we can cope with this challenge uh, uh, together is a very, very important. And then, oh, of course, needless to say that everybody, including the Chinese leader, North Korean leader, Iranian leader, everybody is watching us. So oh, we need to be really, really have to work closely. And then here in Poland, I really would like to emphasize the importance of the deepening dialogue between Europe and Japan. And because both of us really need to engage global US uh, 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 actions, and then we do need to, uh, uh, to work together. So again, that I really do hope that the, this event will be very, very important and timely. And then the, what uh, Ms. Ichikawa uh, is going to present is going to stimulate the uh, audiences that, that, at today's seminar. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to have a very active discussion. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your for introductory remarks about and um, reminding us about what is going on here, and that it's very important to to have close cooperation between uh, between Europe, Poland, and Japan, which is absolutely true. So uh, now I would like to pass the floor to our honorable guest, uh, Ms. Tomiko Ichikawa, for her keynote speech. Over to you, Tomiko. Uh, thank you very much, Justina. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Polish Institute of International Affairs, PISM, and the Embassy of Japan in Poland for inviting me to this event. Uh, actually, Justina, in her opening remarks, and Ambassador Miyajima already summed up why talking about the security environment in the Indo-Pacific today is important for the audience in Poland. Uh, in the limited time, I will try to expand and explain the security situation in the Indo-Pacific and why it is relevant to our audience in Poland and also why the notion of a free and open Indo-Pacific is relevant and important for our European friends. Let me say at the beginning that today uh, I talk in my personal capacity. Uh, I'm currently at JAIA uh, and I also worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but today I'm talking in my own capacity. And on that basis, let me start uh, uh, my uh, conversation with one personal recollection of the time when I was working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and dealing with the European affairs. It was in the early 2000s. It was really at the beginning of the common European foreign and security policy. And in one of the conversations that we had with some EU officials, the, our counterpart, our European uh, colleagues said, that there was no immediate security threat near or around the European borders. Well, uh, listening to these remarks back then, we felt how different uh, the perception of security uh, between Europe and Japan and how it would be difficult for the Japanese side to get the understanding of our European friends about the seriousness of the security situation in East Asia. Today, of course, and unfortunately, the security environment is much more challenging, both in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific. And the situation in these two regions are much more closely linked to each other. So I'd like to uh, proceed with three parts. First, I'd like to present a brief overview of the security environment in the Indo-Pacific. Second, I would like to also talk about the rapid rapprochement between China and Russia. This aspect was already touched upon by Justina, but I would like to also expand on that. And also maybe even compared 
to the situation in 2017 that Justina just mentioned, it is really becoming much more visible and particularly notable in the military security area. And I'd like to conclude with some explanation on why the uh, notion of free and open Indo-Pacific is relevant and important for our European friends, not something which is very far away, but why it is relevant. So let me start with the first point, the security environment in the Indo-Pacific. In one sentence, it is severe and getting worse. I'd like to pick up three, well, important factors from my personal point of view. One is, as a background, the remaining Cold War structure in this region. And the second is China. And the third is North Korea. So first point, the remaining Cold War structure. It may not be, have been quite obvious, particularly in this early days in the 2000s, that the Cold War structure essentially remains in Northeast Asia, as the political system in China and the DPRK have not changed. Of course, establishment of you know, diplomatic relations and so on happened after the end of Cold War world, uh, in worldwide, but essentially the regimes remain and the kind of nature of the regimes are the same. So this is one of the characteristics, probably, uh, it was difficult to convey to our European friends in, back in these days. And the second factor is, of course, China. Uh, I don't spend too much time, but let me pick up a couple of points. First is, of course, following its rapid economic growth, uh, China is rapidly expanding its military capabilities. And China is also becoming more and more assertive in its foreign and domestic policies. Uh, for the military, actually, traditionally, the People's Liberation Army, Chinese Army, was really army, ground forces centered in the old days. But in the past 20 years or so, and in particular in the past 10 years or so, the PLA has been expanding exponentially in the maritime capability and air force missiles, and more recently also their nuclear capabilities. As a result, the military balance in the Western Pacific is becoming more and more favorable to the Chinese side compared to the US side as the time passes. And we expect that this general trend will continue in the near future. Uh, but the issue is not only limited to pure military or kind of strictly speaking military area. Uh, China is also developing and expanding its security apparatus capability, uh, such as the Coast Guard. It is becoming a uh, quite close to military in the sense that they are under the military authority almost. And China enacted the Coast Guard law, which has really kind of, which has really uh, important uh, enforcement element. And also we are seeing reports that Chinese Navy is transferring some of its vessels to the Coast Guard. So, and they are also uh, becoming more and more assertive in their activities. So many people are talking about potential of military conflict and so on, but it may be that more subtle and more incremental security kind of encroachment might happen in the future with more ambiguous legal status, which may be even more difficult to manage. And regarding the assertiveness, uh, it is also uh, evident in China's internal and external policies, and also their uh, activities in the East and the South China Seas, and as shown by the territorial claims, incursions into the territorial waters around the Senkaku Islands, 
and building and expanding the military capabilities in the South China Sea. And regarding Taiwan, uh, we are seeing uh, increased uh, Chinese uh, military activities in the air and water near Taiwan. And we are also witnessing more exercises or maneuvers which are probably believed to be linked to potential uh, invasion plans. And China is also uh, using to its uh, economic leverage for political or diplomatic uh, purposes. Japan also was targeted several years ago related to the Senkak issue. And the Republic of Korea uh, also became a target related to the introduction of missile defense. More recently, Australia also uh, after demanding investigation of the origin of COVID-19. And I think you are more familiar with the situation for Lit Lithuania after the establishment of representative office of Taiwan. And China is also using its so-called warrior diplomacy, propaganda, influence operation. And there are, although we cannot establish close, uh, clearly, cyber attacks by entities suspected to be linked to Chinese military. These elements may sound also very similar to the way Russia has been operating vis-a-vis -vis Europe. And the third element in the security situation in the East Asia in the Pacific is the DPRK. Well, this is kind of my specialty area. So I cannot uh, let go without, uh, we cannot, I cannot pass on this matter. And I'd like to emphasize uh, particularly the missile development more rec most recently. In 2021, uh, there were eight missile launches including various types of missiles, cruise missiles, hypersonic missiles, and submarine launched missiles. And going into 2022, in January alone, in one month alone, they already conducted missile launches seven times. And most recently, uh, it was intermediate range missile, which means that it is, it's really an increased security threat to Japan. Uh, particularly so because the DPRK said that they have already developed and deployed these missiles. And DPRK also showed some indication that it may restart a longer range ICBM and nuclear tests, uh, which means they will go back to pre-summit uh, days with US President, uh, then, then US President Trump. So if this happens, it means that we are going to return to the very heightened tension like in 2017, but the major difference is with much more developed DPRK's nuclear and missile capabilities. And regarding nuclear, uh, the DPRK has not conducted nuclear tests since 2017, but North Korea continues to develop the nuclear weapons and stated its intention to produce, for example, smaller, lighter nuclear weapons with, for the tactical weaponization, which means short range missiles, direct threat to Japan and the region. And also they are aiming at producing so-called supersized nuclear warhead, upgrading the capability of preemptive, preemptive strike and retaliation against strategic target, meaning deterrence against the US. So this was the security situation in the Indo-Pacific. And my second uh, point is the visible rapprochement between China and Russia, particularly last year. Last year, what we saw was that the US and Russia have been trying to maintain a kind of certain level of relations, but their relations have deteriorated in the course of 2021. And of course, as you already mentioned, Justina, the uh, significantly heightened tension over Ukraine since autumn. In parallel with this US-Russia uh, relations, we saw increased Russia-China cooperation. Of course, these two countries have been cooperating with each other uh, in, on many diplomatic agenda. Uh, for a long time ago. Like we saw it in the context of Iran nuclear issue, the DPRK nuclear issue, 
and many other politically important agenda. But the Russia-China rapprochement has been notable in 2021 in the context of kind of so-called democracies versus authoritarian autocratic regimes, and particularly in military domain. For example, we saw increased cooperation between China and Russia regarding Afghanistan issues, and they deepened their engagement with the countries neighboring Afghanistan following the US withdrawal. And most notable in the military cooperation was the joint exercise in Western China for counter-terrorism operations, again related to Afghanistan, and the first joint China-Russia naval fleet cruise in waters around Japan through Tsugaru and Osumi Straits. Actually, these two straits may not be quite obvious to you, so I just prepared one personal map. This is not official, and these arrows are totally conceptual. But what we remarked was that after joint Chinese-Russia naval exercises, they passed through two straits of Japan. One is Tsugaru Strait between Honshu, the main big main island, and Hokkaido. And then they went into Pacific and then returned again to the Chinese direction through another uh, strait just south of Kyushu. So this is the first time that we saw this kind of joint uh, cruise com uh, by China and Russia. Of course, we cannot uh, say for sure what their intention was, but if you look at this, and this actually, uh, I'm using the map with a different direction than you, you usually see, so that you can have a bit of idea about how Japan, Taiwan, or these areas may look like from the Eurasian, Eurasian continent, from the Russia and China perspective. So this is something that we saw, and we will watch carefully uh, what they are going to do this year regarding their naval exercises. Naval exercises themselves are not the first time, but their passage was probably sending us some signals. So this was my third point. Uh, sorry, second point. And my third point, then in this context, why a free and open Indo-Pacific is important, relevant uh, for Europe. This notion, a free and open Indo-Pacific, was first proposed by the then Prime Minister Abe of Japan back in 2016. Uh, it has a wide geographical scope. It literally addresses Pacific and Indian oceans, including the East Coast of the Middle East region and Africa. And various activities, both in political, security, and economic area, are proposed to promote peaceful development of this wide region. There are some, of, uh, there are some basic principles uh, which underpin this notion. Some of them is particularly relevant to today's discussion is the rule-based international order, rule of law, freedom of navigation flight, opposition to a unilateral attempt to change the status quo by force, free trade, including opposition to economic coercion. These principles, I believe, are also applicable to the situation in Europe. And most recently, you can just think about Lithuania and Ukraine. And this FOIP, Free and Open Indo-Pacific, uh, is a kind of very flexible uh, notion, and it's not a rigid regime. And in order to promote uh, this notion, Japan is uh, pursuing multi-layered cooperative relations and activities with countries in the region, but also countries outside the region uh, that share the basic, basic values. Uh, we have close uh, cooperation in the form of Quad, uh, four countries cooperative framework between the US, Japan, India, and Australia. We also very closely work very closely with ASEAN. We also are deepening our cooperation with EU and individual European countries. So why it is important 
for Europe to understand and work together for the FOIP? Well, one practical reason is that the Indo-Pacific region is very important economic partner for Europe and the peace and the stability and prosperity in that region is important for the whole world. But more fundamentally, upholding the open and stable international order around the world needs application to individual cases and individual regions. And at the same time, because of this increased independence, as already you mentioned, Justina and Ambassador Miyajima mentioned, all the countries are watching what is happening in one particular part of the world to understand what their implications to the other regions. And we witnessed actually uh, and welcomed the increased and increasing European interest in the Indo-Pacific area in 2021. We saw EU issued its strategy and there have been a lot of debate at the European Parliament. There were also other important policy documents and there were also active debate on European relations with China and Taiwan. And also several countries in Europe dispatched their naval ships to the region like the UK, France and Germany. So uh, what I'd like to stress in my concluding my initial remarks is the importance of our commitment to fundamental principles that we share everywhere in the world, which means that we cannot ignore what is happening in Europe, of course, and we hope that you will not ignore what's happening in the Indo-Pacific. And actually by way of dialogue at today's, uh, we welcome the deepening of understanding and dialogue with our European friends, such as Poland. So I'll stop here and I'll be very happy to continue our discussions. Uh, thank you Tomiko very, very much for extremely inspiring uh, speech about the situation in Asia, focusing on uh, Cold War structures that still remain in, in Asia, about China, DPRK, also about the, your perspective about the closer uh, relations between Russia and China and its, its disinformation about this naval um, exercises and passage um, uh, through or near Japan is extremely interesting and important, I think, for our discussion. Also, thinking about what's, what, what uh, Russia is doing right now in Europe and <clears throat> questioning if there is a kind of a contact or coordination with China. Interesting, extremely. And of course, <clears throat> your remarks about why it is important to focus on this uh, notion of a free. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, notion, not only about, but we are, for us, it's obvious that it, the stability all over the world is important for us as Europeans, but also about the economic cooperation and norms and values, which is, I think, also extremely important. So now I would like to ask uh, uh, Oskar Petrovich for his comments. And um, I think it, uh, it was really important and it's interesting keynote speech. So I'd like to um, know what, um, what's your opinion, your thoughts uh, about uh, Ms. Uh, Ichikawa's speech. Uh, Oscar, over to you. Thank you, Justina. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Director General uh, Tomiko Ichikawa for your excellent and insightful presentation. As the topic of today's seminar is very broad, I would like to share with you a few comments and observations on two issues. A short comment about the in the Pacific and free and open in the Pacific concept, and second, uh, about opportunities and limitations of European engagement in Asia and uh, Europe Japan security cooperation. Uh, first, my general observation, as uh, Ms. Ichikawa mentioned, uh, in the Pacific and uh, FOIP is very flexible concept. So it could be understood and defined in very, very, uh, in various ways. In effect, in the Pacific could be seen not as a geographic reality, but as a, I would say, catchy phrase with which the advocates of this concept want to shape the international environment in a way that will serve their purposes. 
Therefore, each country has or could have its own Indo-Pacific concept, which it uh, defines uh, based on different interests and needs. The differences in its definition are visible, among others, in the documents of countries that recognize it as a priority, for example, Japan, Australia, India, or the US. Uh, regardless of all doubts, uh, the term in the Pacific has been increasingly used. Uh, moreover, the term free and open in the Pacific was not only picked up uh, by the Trump administration, but also is continued by Biden administration. So two following US administrations has contributed to the spread of the Japanese narrative about Asia. In other words, Japan has been trying to shape the discourse on Asia for years and has been successful in this area. So big congratulations to Japan because it's your, it's, it is your success, this kind of discourse. And the second point uh, about in the Pacific from a European perspective, uh, Having highlighted definition problems with the Indo-Pacific, I would say that this kind of um, problems is very common, uh, for example, in Europe. Uh, although there have been ongoing debate about strategic autonomy within the EU, uh, EU for years, I suppose so far we have not reached common understanding of this concept and how it should be implemented, for example, in security realm. But I believe taking into account an uh, interdependent nature of challenges, the success of the EU strategic autonomy depends uh, mainly on close cooperation with partners and allies. I've mentioned the strategic autonomy of the EU because undoubtedly one of the elements serving the implementation of this concept is the EU strategy for cooperation in the Indo Pacific. The EU strategy suggests an attempt to diversify partnerships and cooperate with middle powers, like-minded partners, regional actors like Japan, South Korea, ASEAN, India, to realize Europeans' interest in the region where US-China competition intensifies. Uh, and even though the region is not the, uh, in the immediate uh, European neighborhood, the security of the Indo-Pacific is of particular significance to the EU due to Indo-Pacific's growing importance to the world economy, growing tensions, increasing links with Europe, the rise of China and Sino-American competition. And especially the US-China competition within uh, Indo-Pacific has consequences for the EU and its member states. This is because uh, the US has an essential role in European security and has been actively encouraging uh, its European allies to focus more on China as a threat to national or international and international security. As such, how the EU frames security challenges in the Indo-Pacific, as well as how it implements its Indo-Pacific strategy, is likely to have repercussions for transatlantic relations and ultimately European security. And I see both opportunities and limitations for Europe's security involvement in Asia and cooperation with Japan in this dimension. Uh, on the side of opportunities, I think the most notable the, uh, are the principles. The principles behind the European engagement in the Indo-Pacific brings the EU and Japan closer. In security and defense domain, the EU seeks to promote an open and rules-based regional security architecture, including secure sea lines of communications, capacity building, and enhanced, uh, enhanced uh, naval presence in the Indo-Pacific. Um, moreover, the EU and Japan are like-minded partners, sharing values and views on major political and global issues, challenges and threats. Uh, European countries face many of the same security challenges as their partners in the Indo-Pacific. I see two most important security challenges in the Indo-Pacific from the our point of, European point of uh, view maritime security and cyber security and economic and security concerns around the maritime domain lay at the heart of EU documents in the region. Uh, on the other hand, to respond uh, to cyber threats, uh, which the most significant source is China and Russia, the European Union launched in December 2020 its uh, cybersecurity uh, strategy. Uh, since I said about opportunities, now I have to say something about limitations. Uh, because I think successful and responsible cooperation between the EU and Japan should be embedded in reality. 
Uh, so uh, although uh, EU has its in the Pacific strategy, we also need to take into account Europe's divisions over how to approach the Indo-Pacific. There are member states differing views whether to consider the Indo-Pacific in strategy or primarily economic terms. Adoption of EU's Indo-Pacific strategy could be also viewed as both a way to manage the transatlantic alliance and a way to demonstrate strategic autonomy. The European countries also differ in their approach towards China and the US, which further complicates involvement in the in the Pacific. And I would like to stress absolutely basic problem in this security from the security perspective. The EU is not willing or considering to play a major military role in Asia Pacific or in the Pacific. Security issues are not mentioned in EU top objectives in its Indo-Pacific strategy. Defense and security is only one out of seven priority areas and mostly covers maritime security and cybersecurity. The EU has neither capacity nor the political will to play major role for military security in Indo-Pacific. And despite general support to EU in the Pacific strategy, only a few countries have appropriate capabilities and political will to increase involvement in security affairs in Asia, especially France. Most of European countries, uh, for example, from Central Eastern Europe are primarily interested in mutually beneficial economic cooperation with the Pacific partners with limited or even no political ambitions to increase involvement in security uh, dimension. This is because the main challenges and tasks for the EU are related to our own security in our neighborhood. We need to take into account the differences between European and Japanese security priorities and threat uh, perception. But taking into account issues I've mentioned, it seems to me that the most promising area of security cooperation between the EU, its member states and Japan are related to maritime and cyber domain. Uh, and the maritime domain, as Japan is indicated as one of the key partners in both the EU in the Pacific strategy and the British, French and German strategies, one of the areas of European Japanese cooperation will be maritime security, especially how to secure sea routes. And I think this should be achieved through intensifying and broadening the scope of joint exercises, maneuvers, pursuing dialogues between the officials of defense ministers and so on maybe the cooperation between defense industries. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in cybersecurity, it's a, it's, it's a second area the most EU member states share concerns. So cooperations with Japan uh, on cybersecurity is of direct value. Uh, the strategic partnership uh, agreement signed between the EU and Japan in 2018 uh, especially calls for sectoral cooperation in digital sphere. Japan released uh, its cybersecurity in 2018 and the same year the Japanese government established cyberspace as a new defense domain and published a defense strategy that assigned a more important role to cyber issues. Uh, but I think to address the increasing complexity and global reach of cyber threats uh, and challenges and to enhance their defense capabilities, Japan and the EU will need to strengthen the bilateral um, cooperation, enhance the operational interactions in response to cyber attacks and become leaders in shaping international norms and standards in cyberspace. So this is how I see the general, uh, in general, the potential of European Japanese cooperation in the security dimension in the in the Pacific. I wonder if this coincides uh, with Japan's perception and expectations. I would be grateful if Ms. Ichikawa indicate most needed and promising areas of security cooperation with Europe from Japanese point of view, bearing in mind uh, European capabilities and uh, limitations. So for now, it's that for, for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oscar, very, very much for your, for your remarks. Uh, about our understanding or different understanding of free um, um, open Indo-Pacific uh, concept or notion, also about our priorities as, as, as Europe, that, uh, that the security is not number one and probably in the near future, it will be difficult to, to have it as a number one. And also your, uh, your uh, suggestions um, about this cooperation between Europe and Japan when it comes to security issues like maritime and cyber. Uh, domains. 
Um, before we go to the uh, to the um, um, let's say Q and A session, I would like to add, remind our virtual participants that you can pose your questions um, uh, through Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter uh, chat functions. I have already received two questions, uh, and I would like to address. The first one is from uh, um, uh, Professor Ma uh, Martin Jacobi from. Uh, SWPS uh, University in Warsaw, uh, and the question is uh, addressed to um, uh, to Miss Tomiko Ichikawa. And the question is, don't you think that passing through the Tsugaru Strait is the Chinese and Russian answer to the freedom of navigation operations using the same tactics that the U.S. and its allies use? So this is the first question. If I made the second one, also uh, from our our virtual participants about your understanding your feeling if uh, Russia feels any threats from China. So it's a question about this, the, the real close, uh, let's say, cooperation between China and Russia. It's said that it's a kind of asymmetric relationship, that China is stronger partner than Russia, so maybe Russia is afraid of something, so decided to, to have close cooperation with uh, uh, with Russia, so uh, maybe I would like pass the floor to um, to Tomiko if you would like to have some comments after Oscar's comments, and then if you could take those two questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Oscar, for your quite insightful comments. And I'd like, oh, like to also address two question questions that Justina just mentioned. Uh, regarding the potential areas of cooperation between Europe and Japan, uh, the two areas you mentioned, maritime and cyber, I believe uh, certainly have quite great potentials, uh, particularly maritime domain. Uh, big, uh, we have been talking about the importance of the Indo-Pacific uh, from the point of view of its rapid economic growth and as a very important trading partner for the Europe. So maritime security is a very important common good for all the countries benefit. And here I believe that there is quite a good potential for cooperation between Japan and Europe. Uh, regarding cyber, yes, of course. And maybe Europe has been also kind of developing more concrete uh, policies, strategies, and activities because of Europe's own experience in this arena. Uh, regarding cyber, I think uh, not only kind of technical cyber security, but also, as I mentioned, more about influence opinion, how you know, authoritarian regime countries could use to their advantage our freedom of speech might be also another area that we might able to compare notes and learn from each other's experience. Uh, rapidly, uh, sorry, quickly addressing two questions. Uh, regarding the intention of Russia and China uh, for their passage of the Tsugaru and Osumi Straits, uh, we of course cannot be certain about their intention, but the reason why I showed their trajectory uh, with the map is to see how it, uh, to, to show how it may be seen from their perspective. And although they did not declare their intention publicly, we can imagine that they included the kind of message that uh, Dr. Jacobi mentioned in their trajectory. Uh, it was also uh, almost immediate, immediately after the announcement of AUKUS. Uh, maybe this uh, trajectory was planned before. Uh, in that case, it's more closely re related to freedom of navigation. Uh, it may be also reflecting some of uh, these uh, new, uh, their response to this new development. Of course, we are not certain, but the freedom of navigation element is something that we could imagine uh, to be in their mind. And regarding Russia-China relations, uh, we have been seeing, as I said, from a diplomatic point of view, close Russia-China cooperation uh, in uh, foreign policy. On the, other, oh, on the other hand, 
uh, is there a connection issue? I think it's now restored. Yes, right. Uh, so Russia, although cooperating closely with China, has been a bit more ambivalent about how closely they coordinate and cooperate with China on the security and the military front. But as I said, in 2021, I think Russia decided to work much more closely uh, with China, also on the security and military front. Uh, we do not know in the long run what Russia's perception of China there may be also economic disparity, etc. However, uh, we believe that in the context of the current juxtaposition of democracies versus authoritarian and autocratic regimes, uh, Russia and China see both of them uh, as more natural for them to get closer how it will play out in longer term, particularly from economic point of view. That is something that we don't have an answer today. So I will stop here and I'm happy to answer uh, other questions. Thank you very much, Tomiko. We have another two questions, the, uh, to, both to you and to Oscar. So maybe we'll start with Oscar. Um, it's a question from Ms. Isabella Yachnitska and your question to Oscar is as, as follows. In the face of escalating US-China rivalry, uh, do European countries have any real tools to leverage pressure on the DPRK? So Oscar, there's a question to you, and I would like, I would like also to, to read a question to, uh, to Tomiko, also from Ms. Isabella Yachnitska, um, who is asking that Prime Minister Kishida announced a revision of the Japan's national security strategy what changes can we expect? What consequences could they have for the Indo-Pacific and for Europe? So I will let you ask Oscar to start answering as, as a first person. Thank you, thank you for this uh, tough question. Uh, tough, very problematic from European perspective. Uh, because I think the uh, North Korea, uh, through this uh, recent missile test, uh, North Korea wants to make other countries get used to the fact that the DPRK tests its weapons once in a while, like other countries. North Korea message is like, you have to get used to it and understand that you cannot change it and stop us from testing and wait for more. That's the message from, uh, from uh, North Korea. And I think it's very, very problematic uh, for a non-proliferation regime. Uh, but I think it is in the interest of the EU and its member states to remain quite flexible with North Korea. Uh, in addition to uh, implementing sanctions justified by North's repeated viola violations of uh, UN Security Council resolutions, EU countries my personal perspective is that they should uh, maintain contacts with North Korean diplomats. Uh, maybe the renewal of EU North Korea 1.5 track diplomacy with the gradual inclusion of US and South Korean participants could revive diplomatic and experts contacts between the US and uh, both uh, Koreas. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, frankly speaking, I'm afraid that no matter how we, not only Europe, but Washington and Seoul respond to the North's uh, January missile test and next test, Pyongyang will keep testing more missiles in the coming months while staying silent on the US and South Korean calls for talks and European calls for talks. I assume it will be a year of testing, not a year of diplomacy. Uh, and that uh, would be very, very problematic. Uh, according to sanctions, uh, any proposal at the UN Security Council to impose additional sanctions, uh, not only by European countries, but also by uh, um, United States on North Korea, is likely to be vo vetoed by two of the permanent members in the Council, China and Russia, like at a closed door meeting at the UN Security Council on January 20th, when US proposal was blocked by China and Russia. So from this perspective, the DPRK has the backing of two of five, uh, of, five uh, of the permanent members of the UN Security Council for its behavior. It actually means that North Korea is not politically isolated. Thank you, Oscar, and over to Tomiko. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to also uh, echo what Oscar said about the DPRK, and it may also, you know, showing some frustration vis-a-vis -vis US. And when I said everybody is watching what's happening on Ukraine now, or Taiwan, all these things, North Korea has been certainly watching very carefully how the US-China relations and how the US-Russia relations are unfolding. So back in, go back, going back to my uh, the question that addressed to me, yes, the current uh, administration uh, led by Prime Minister Kishida announced its intention to revise the national security strategy so that it will be adapted to the current security environment. Uh, being not in the government, I cannot say for sure what will be included, but one element which we are quite sure uh, to be included in the new version uh, will be the economic security aspect. Uh, the, the first version of the national security strategy, which is the current one, did not cover this aspect, but we see that in the context of US-China uh, strategic competition, the, this aspect, economic security, particularly uh, how to secure the advanced uh, technologies, supply chains like semiconductors, and important uh, strategic resources like rails and infrastructure, uh, all these things are getting involved more and more in the realm, realm of security than before. And we think this aspect of economic security will be certainly included in one way or the other in the new version of the national security strategy. Another element which has been attracting probably the press, not in well, media attention, not only in Japan, but worldwide, is what the Japanese defense posture will be in conjunction with the US. Uh, defense posture in the coming years. And here, it's not only about the extent of the spending on the defense capabilities, but also the nature of Japan's defense capabilities and whether it should remain exactly the same as we have been doing in the past, or because of all the things happening all around the world and the US uh, the own need to have its allies and friends working more closely together and stepping up their own defense capabilities. Like, actually, I think this is also reflected a lot in NATO debate. So what Japan can and should do uh, needs to reflect the current security environment, uh, of course, within the, all the legal and constitutional limitations that we have. But from the policy perspective, I understand that the current government is really trying to looking at all these fundamental questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have many, many questions from my side also, and also from, uh, from our audience. Uh, we have two minutes left. I, I think that we could extend a, a little bit, let's say three minutes. So let me, uh, let me ask my question if I may, because I'm still looking for some links and some uh, experience that you can share uh, between Europe and, and Asia. And uh, Tomiko, you mentioned uh, answering the last question about this economic security aspect. And what I think it's also the kind of overlaps that um, Japan is pretty uh, in interlinked economically with China. And recently we are using how the EU is dependent economically on China. I'm talking about the Lithuania case that China tried to, um, you know, to use these interdependencies as a weapon because of shallow economic uh, ties with Lithuania. So China tried to, uh, to, uh, to deploy this retaliatory uh, measures, not only against Lithuania directly, but also some multinationals that are operating uh, with Lithuania or in Lithuania or invest that have investment in China. So it is a very, uh, um, let's say, sophisticated and new retaliatory measures that China decided to use against Europe, generally speaking. So I'll let you ask you how Japan is dealing with this. On the one hand, it independence, economic interdependence, but on the other hand, it's the security issues. And my second question, if I may, it's also, I think it's important because 
uh, we in Europe, when United States decided to let's say, pivot to Asia and looking uh, on, on Asia and um, right now, Trump administration and Biden, of course, for them, the China is the most important let's say, challenge. So there are some threats that, uh, that US may focus on Asia. So we, we be in that sense, be less uh, engaged in the security uh, in Europe. Right now, the situation it's a little bit reversed because we have we have a problem with Russia and a potential, let's say, war. Uh, so U.S. In, is uh, focused on Europe. So I would like to ask if you right now, as Japanese uh, experts and people in Asia, are uh, a little bit afraid of the fact that U.S. is preoccupied with with uh, with Europe. So maybe there would there would be a room for China to do something aggressive, let's say, against Taiwan. So this is my question, if I may. Uh, and it, also the question uh, from our, the last one, because we should st stop in two, three minutes. The last one from, uh, from our, uh, our participant, also Miss, uh, Miss Isabella Janiska, and it's a question both to, to you, Tomiko, and Oscar. Uh, um, uh, and the question is as follows. Asian experts underline that Europeans uh, lack proper understanding of the threat posed by China. Well, it's a question mark. I think we are now becoming more, more familiar with about threat from coming from China. But and so, what are the political consequences of this of this perception now, and what might be in the future? So maybe uh, we start with Tomiko and we end with Oscar. Uh, thank you very much. You asked very uh, uh, a, a couple of very important questions. Uh, it may be difficult to answer in a few minutes, but I'll try. First of all, economic dependence. Actually, it's not limited to Japan, not even limited to Asia. As you said, Europe has also quite close ties with China and it's increasing. And even the US, uh, many US companies have invested heavily in China and China is a very, very big market, quite attractive market for all, over, uh, for all the countries and all the enterprises. So this kind of economic interdependence, even in the midst of US-China confrontational uh, situation is a very unique feature of this strategic competition and which is very different from the US-USSR uh, confrontation during the Cold War. And so what we are seeing is that, I think here again, US, Japan, Europe can work together in terms of economic security. At the same time, we know, and I think our American colleagues also know, that our economy cannot be totally decoupled from China because the world is so interlinked, interdependent, and the activities cannot be separate from each other. So I think there will be continued economic linkage interdependence, but at the same time, in a more maybe focused way, economic security will become certainly a major agenda. And not only economic security from a strategic perspective, we are also seeing a tightening, tightening of regulations in the US and also in Europe regarding human rights. So all these supply chain issues will become very important in the future. And I think that is one of the point uh, points that the new uh, national security strategy in Japan is going to address. Uh, regarding the how US preoccupation in one region might be seen by the others. Well, it's a complex world that we live in and we are affected by you know, th things happening everywhere. Already economically, for example, the price of oil, gas, all these things are affected by the heightening tension. And more strategically, uh, if you know you and, and you already mentioned both of you that US cannot tackle all the issues arising all over the world alone. So and also we saw this kind of a conundrum when we addressed the issue of nuclear problem. We wanted US to focus more on the DPRK, but while they were negotiating JCPOA with Iran, their focus was on Iran. But in the end, they understand the, of course, they are the one who understands the best, the global implication of any regional issues. And what we can do is that uh, work together on both issues, both in Europe and Asia, and cooperate more closely with each other between Japan and Europe, 
and with US. Uh, and the consequences, well, there are many things that cannot be foreseen, like 9-11 attacks, which really you know, uh, made the world upside and down. And no one could probably imagine how it would affect the world and the US for 20 years to come. So I think we have to adapt ourselves to the changing world. And rather than looking back, we need to focus on the present and the near future and to work out our post, uh, hopefully common strategy. Thank you. Thanks, Tomiko. And Oscar, your final words. Thank you, very tough questions. Thank you, Isa, for this. <laughs> uh, main consequence, uh, I put it strongly, lack of credibility of the EU and its member states in the eyes of US and Asian partners. Because this question is related to the several unanswered questions when it comes to how the EU is approaching security in the, uh, in the Pacific. Uh, multilateralism and engagement, okay, it sounds good, but if the strategy based on multilateralism and engagement fails for the EU, what then? We've got no answer uh, on these questions. What is the EU's position on major conflict or war in the Indo-Pacific, if war were to break out over the Korean Peninsula or in Taiwan involving EU partners, would the EU be willing to be politically or even militarily entangled in this, or would it want to distance itself? Unfortunately, we don't know. So that's the problem of credibility. And any potential region-wide security crisis in the Indo-Pacific would likely involve the US uh, or, uh, or its allies and partners and China. Yet China and Russia and even the US are largely absent from the discussions of the EU in the Pacific strategy so far. So this is a problem of uh, credibility of uh, European engagement in, in the Pacific. So it's a political consequences uh, I see in, in this perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. We have to finish uh, our meeting because it's almost 10 past 11. Uh, thank you very much. It was a wonderful conversation, very inspiring questions and remarks uh, given by our speakers. Uh, just I would like to pass the floor to Ambassador Mia Gemma for his final remarks, and then we close our meeting. Ambassador, over to you. Thank you really very much for everybody who participated. And, and I myself really uh, learned a lot and enjoyed. Uh, just adding uh, a few more points that uh, may not be my purpose, <clears throat> but I would like the, the, those audience to also following much closer that what is happening between Russia and China and what will be the kind of the domestic political or kind of implication for United States global engagement and also slowing down uh, the, the Chinese economy growth. It, may, it surely has a very serious security impact. So well, there are many, many elements I really do hope has a relevance to, to for the, the thinking about the global security and, and it has an impact on the European security. So let's uh, continue dialogue. And then thank you very much, Tomiko. And then uh, that, uh, really looking forward to working closely that uh, we, Please come to visit Warsaw. Yes, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Once again, thank you. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude both to the Embassy and uh, Japanese Institute of International Affairs uh, for the initiative, for your, for your time, and also to Oscar, who was responsible for organizing from the PISM side the event. So keep in touch. Uh, many works ahead of us because many things will, will, will appear, I'm sure, after today's meeting. Thank you, stay health, uh, have a good evening in Japan and good still good uh, morning uh, in Europe. Thank you, see you, bye bye. Thank you very much, bye and let's continue our conversation. Thank yeah. you.